Welcome. Welcome to Your Women's Circle. And I am your host, Angie Harvey. And it pleasures me to bring you women that you want to see, women you should hear, women you will desire to be in contact with, and women you should absolutely know. Now, today we're going to be talking about aging with Gail Christian, who is half of the Lucy and Gail promotions team and also the producer of the Women's Jazz Festival. And we're also going to be treated to the poetry of Doris Reed, who is a poet and an author. She's going to enlighten and entertain us today. And yes, we're going to be featuring greatness in the circle today. But you know, it's Monday and I have a little motivation to get you growing through this week. Now, most of us grew up in households where adults consistently let us know that the world didn't revolve around us and that it wasn't all about us. Oftentimes we uh, simply would like have a request that would fall on deaf ears, especially if it appeared as if we were asking for a favor. And surely most of us believe that it wasn't about us because we were children, but it would be once we became adults. Not. <laughs> Unfortunately, our, our, our college roommates, our professors, our co-workers, our supervisors, our partners, our spouses quickly smashed that myth. When we would ask for a favor, it too would fall on deaf ears. So we were left bewildered and eventually settled into the fact that mm, it isn't all about us. Well, I hate to break this to you, but you're wrong. You're wrong if you thought that it wasn't. It is all about you and it should be all about you, to you. Yes, we're going about things the wrong way by requesting that other people concede to our wants and our needs. However, if you're willing to put in the work for yourself, things can absolutely turn around in your favor, for your favor, right? The only thing you'll need to do differently is to rely more on yourself than you do on others to grant those wishes. It can be all about you if you make intentional and purposeful efforts to put your needs and wants first. Yes, you heard me. I said it, put you first. I know what you're saying. It's too late in life to change. No, it's not too late. It's definitely not too late to change. Starting today without anyone's permission or approval, you can be, it can be all about you. You can start saying yes to yourself and providing your word, your wants and desires before attending to those around you, right? Those, those self-made crises of others. <laughs> you can start showing up for yourself instead of hoping that someone else finds you worthy of their time and shows up for you. You can start intentionally considering yourself and what makes you happy without considering what someone else might think or feel about it. Or you can just start loving on yourself without the fear that you'll lose the, the, the love of someone else for loving on yourself first. More importantly, you can embrace a new concept, a new way of thinking, and a new way of behaving that confirms what I believe to be true. It is all about you. Now grow on that one. I surely hope that I was able to motivate you on this Monday and for all the Mondays to come. Now. We're in for a treat now. Our first guest is a woman who knows a few things about being unapologetic about putting herself first. Gail Christian is one half of the prom promoter team, Lucy and Gail, and produces events for the LGBTQ women and is the executive director of the Palm Springs Women's Jazz Festival. I want you all to welcome to the circle, Gail Christian. Yeah. Thank you. On, Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, uh, Good Angie, morning. What I want to say before we start in that, uh, I'm the replacement guest this morning, as you know, for Irva Shivad, who was supposed to be here. And uh, I've known Irv a long time, and I just wanted to say that I really can't replace Irva Shivad. She's one of the most intelligent, exciting, thoughtful people that I know. Wow. And I think that she is a major contributor to lesbian culture and to progressive thought in this country. I can't say enough about her, but I'm gonna do my best since Irv is <laughs> not here. But I'm very excited, Angie, this morning. We are in the desert in Palm Springs and we have rain, girl, let me tell you. Yeah. Come on now, rain it, is rain. it rains about as often as a meth head goes to rehab. And I'm telling you, <laughs> it is raining and we are excited out here this morning. 
people can I tell I am you? not going to do this with you. I see that no. this COVID-19 has not dampened your, your, you are funny. I absolutely believe you should have been a comedian, but I thank you for being here and you don't have to replace anybody because you are just a powerhouse in and of yourself. Well, thank now, you. Now, that being said, right, that being said, you know that this COVID-19 has taken a heavy toll on lives, especially those of seniors. And I promise you, I would not consider you a senior, but according to your age, you are. But that's okay. So one of the things that we're going to talk about it, I would love to talk about it, is some of the mental and emotional toll that seniors by your age <laughs> face in society. And that, you know, that the, the willingness to... Um, be politically correct about almost everything except older people. So, like, when did you consider yourself to be old or older? Well, I actually consider myself to be old almost on an hourly basis. It really depends upon how I'm feeling in the moment. But I don't think that's, you know, true for most people. But in the U.S., there is this moment of reckoning where you go to your mailbox and you open it up and here is this letter from AARP. And I, I can't remember what the letter said. I think it said, you old bitch. I don't know what it said. It might have said, <laughs> but then I noticed there was a whole bunch of coupons. And at first you were starting to just need coupons, and then you, you know, you can kind of accept it. But that's sort of what happens because I've gotten lots of calls. People call and say, Girl, did you get that letter from AARP? I turned 50, and that's their birthday gift. And I think that's sort of defines old age for people uh, in the in the U.S. And then that is their, their big day of depression. So it is, it's like, I had to, you know, I'm old. AARP has told me I'm old. And so that's the defining wow. one, I guess, for most of them. <laughs> Did you ever get that letter, Angie? Oh, I vividly remember. I wasn't even 50 yet. I was 49 and three-fourths and I got the letter. But unlike everybody else, I knew in my spirit that I was not old. And so I was just excited about all the benefits. I was I was telling everybody, I'm like, girl, listen, I can go to the movies. I can get gas cheap. Right? Honey, listen, you better wait till you get here. So I didn't necessarily think, oh, but I do get it. I understand. Like, wait a minute. This is the thing that my mother get. <laughs> That's, That's what you think right. about That's it. Right. <laughs> coupon you see that? Oh, three days in the Grand Canyon for three twenty nine. <laughs> exactly. So when you say old, and I do know that, so what do you mean when you say that society, uh, that we aren't politically correct as far as the issue of aging? What does that mean, politically correct around aging? Well, I, th I think that over the years, well, while, uh, you know, the uh, um, U.S. society is pretty much unwilling to really do anything about any serious social change, what they do to make you think that they are is they start changing the words. So they are willing to stop calling you a bunch of foul names, though they are really willing to give you no job. But so we have become politically correct in terms because there are certain groups that have the clout to force you to stop talking about them bad. Minorities, women. Uh, you know, they can, they put it in, it is no longer politically correct to go around uh, ethnically insulting people. Uh, it's no longer co uh, politically correct to go about making disparaging remarks about queer people. Mm -hmm. But elderly in this time frame, they don't have that clout. So it's, you wow. know, you turn on television and you hear the most horrible thing. Every joke is about somebody old. And don't look at those housewife shows. Their favorite world is like, you an old bitch. And she'd be 32 <laughs> the person they're talking to. So it's perfectly okay to tell jokes about elderly people. Uh, you know, they're uh, going right. to the supermarket. Uh, uh, whatever your experiences are, it's clear that you are over the hill and no longer valued. Right. Right. And so do you, I mean, it sounds like the, the, there's an equation between uh, the, the old and, 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 and over the hill uh, with not being valued and this political correctness not reaching the elderly. What do you think created that atmosphere that, you, that, you know, that people are just treat people not good because they're older? I, th I think it sort of goes back to the uh, beginning of time uh, in this country where it's very important in order for 
our system to work effectively, that there's a whole bunch of people who have to be played and be valued in order to be exploited. And, you know, it's like you, and, and, and that's what, I mean, every time, every time you are devalued, that translates into you work for cheap. It, it, you know, it translates into someone else's advantage. So, and I learned that very young. I was very, I was very lucky as a kid. Uh, I'm, I grew up at the beach at Venice, California. And when I was a kid, about 10 years old, the people that moved next door to us was this man and his wife, and they belonged to the Communist Party. And every Friday night, they'd come over to our house, and my parents would try to hide, and they would bring these Paul Robeson <laughs> records and they would sit down and talk about the exploitation of black people and so i thought it was fascinating i picked up on that early <laughs> at 10 years old i knew that you were being devalued in order to be exploited so, and i think that unfortunately that's just built into the fiber of our uh, society in order for some to stay ahead there is this assumption that you have to screw over the rest of us or devalue us or make us feel bad about ourselves. Oh, wow. Wow. It, wow it, is right. That, yeah, wow is right. Because literally, I don't know that I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm a social worker. I worked for 15 years for an organization and work with the elderly population. And I don't know that I thought about it in those terms that you, you're speaking about, which is so very valid. Um, what effects do you feel like uh, this has on seniors, specifically on women who are older? I think it has a terrible effect. I think when you when you couple that with COVID, where people are already uh, locked down, locked in, and when that happens, you really need the strength to you know to pull on what's ever inside of you to make the day work for you. And too often, if you are old, you are letting yourself be defined someone else. And you must define yourself, as you were talking about that. You must define yourself. And I think that, unfortunately, when I look around, I see women, just uh, not only women, but men, but we're talking about women, we're talking particularly about, about you know, particularly LGBTQ women who I always thought wouldn't fall for it. But right. everybody seems to fall for it. And, uh, uh, you know, it's like, and it's, it's easy. I don't know quite where it starts, but it's everything from, you know, from facelifts to uh, trying to find a girlfriend that's 30 years younger than you to validate yourself. You know, like at one time, I really seriously <laughs> thought about getting a facelift. I said, let me run down here and get some facelift, some Botox. <laughs> but then I equated that. Remember in the old days when black people used to use Nad Nola and that other right. kind of light, light, I put it, you know, I think people should look as good as they want to look. It's not right. my business what you do to improve yourself. Obviously, I don't do much, as you can tell. But the point yeah. is that on some level, you have to equip that with tightening your skin and straightening your hair. And the minute right. you do that, right. on some level, you devalue yourself. And I think it's very important for women to be able not to believe the hype. You know, you are as good, old, you know, you're as old as you want to be. I'm having a birthday next month. I'm going to be 82. No, I'm going to be 81 years old. Did you just say, no, I'm not going to be 82. I'm going to be no, 81. That's right. And I'm really not, I'm not going to buy into any of this stuff. You know, I get up every morning, go to work like everybody else, do what I have to do. And, you know, right. hey, I'm 12 years old some days. So right. Exactly. Really, not, you know, it's about selling you products. It's about, you know, it's not about anything uh, uh, meaningful. It's, you know, it's mostly just, uh, you know, a lot of bullshit. Uh, as you age, you have enough problems focusing on your health and your finances. So you need to feel good about yourself. You don't need no young girlfriend to make you feel good. I mean, they don't, they don't you know, hey, look, Angie, you look delicious. What can I say? You know, young girlfriend, you know, you're too bad. Hey, hey, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, negate young girlfriend by any means. But, uh, you know what I mean? Right. I completely understand what you're talking about. I heard some very key words in there. Uh, you spoke about validation. You spoke about uh, emotions. You spoke about finances. And I think that 
society as a whole doesn't prepare you um, to take on those things in the way that they do, nor do you, I mean, a, most of society doesn't consider that when they get to a place where they're considered older, that they're going to have to fight some of the same fights and some of the same struggles. And it sounds like that those fights and those struggles are real uh, and they continue whether we want them to or not. Um, how do you feel like, well, how do you protect yourself from, from falling into this, this trap? Because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like a trap, a trap to make you feel not valued, a trap to make you feel like you're less than, a trap to make you feel like you're no longer any good. And so we look for all these outside resources. Is there any way that anything that you do to protect yourself from that? It sounds like a great mindset or that other people can do to protect themselves from falling into the trap. Like how do you, how do you get people out the trap? Well, I, th I think that it's, it's probably easier for, uh, for African Americans because, you know, we have always been in a trap, but we realize it very, because of the level of our oppression, we realize that very early that we are always the ones being tricked. I think it might be harder for white women who, in fact, you know, mm. for a very long time, uh, they're, while certainly not to, uh, you know, not to say that they were not considerably oppressed, but I think that maybe not knowing that uh, it is sometimes harder for, for white people than it is for people of color to understand that you are just being, uh, that it's really about someone uh, uh, wanting to, not give you a job or to pay you less or someone wanting to, uh, for, for whatever reasons, get you out of the job market to open up the job market uh, for younger uh, people for, uh, uh, and so I think that you can get out of the trap by focusing on your own self-worth mm -hmm. and really not yeah. be the kind of person that is as yeah. good as what somebody said about you that day. You're as good as what you say about yourself on any given day. Yes, I love that. You say literally don't don't believe the hype. Don't you are as, right. Don't believe the hype. Now, I personally cannot imagine anybody uh, uh, speaking to you, telling you what you can and cannot do as it relates to you being an older person, because you've been dynamic the entire time I've ever known you, which has been like the last. 15 years and you were what by most people's standards with age considered to be older, but you've done some amazing work. What keeps Gail going and growing despite your age? Well, I, I think that, I think that based on when I was born, I was born in the forties and that is a time when nobody liked black people in the forties. Nobody <laughs> liked black women in the forties. Nobody liked queers in the 40s. Not one person in the universe liked queers except the other <laughs> queers right now in the bathroom liked each other. So I didn't have anybody to like me. I had to like myself. And my mama liked me, which gave me a, a real advantage. I don't want to underplay that. My mama liked me. She would always say, you're really cute. Come in here and do that little dance. You know, I sing that little <laughs> So, you know, my mama liked me and she said, you know, you better like yourself because I looked at me and nobody liked on me. I think that that gave me an edge that perhaps other people uh, didn't have. And I also think it's important, look at your politics, look at what you believe, uh, because if, if you can get your politics in line, uh, then you'll be okay. But if you're still, uh, you know, uh, running around here waiting to be uh, saved, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't, I don't want, never mind. I don't even want to go there. I don't want to start talking about no politics. Ain't enough time in the week. <laughs> to do that, you progressives know what I'm saying. So, you know. Right. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm afraid to, 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 to kind of curtail things now so that we can bring on the other guests. I'm thinking, is she going to think it's because of her age that I'm saying, okay, it's time to go? <laughs> <laughs> I at all, I mean, not at all. And I really and coming up is Doris Reed, my absolute favorite uh poet. So uh, I am happy to say thank you so much, Angie. It's been a pleasure. And the uh, hello, Doris, uh, knock it out the ballpark. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Gail, for sharing your very candid and 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 keeping it real, candid opinions and keeping it real. I absolutely appreciate you being with here. Oh my goodness. I think she just did my job. I think she just introduced the next guest. So I, I might want to do a commercial before it end because uh, 
you're trying to take my job, (laughs) y'all. So as you all know, this program is sponsored by Your Women's Circle, and it's an organization that provides you with a place to connect with the LGBTQ community, to socialize, as well as make professional connections and share resources. And I absolutely encourage you to join this organization. It will be the best investment you could make for yourself and for your business if you're an entrepreneur or an artist or someone that's selling something. And to learn more about the benefits of being in the circle and to join, please, you can check them out at www.yourswomenscircle.com. Y-O-U-R-W-O-M-E-N-S-S-C-I-R-C-L-E. I better not try to do that again. I tried to look at that without seeing it. Yeah. Anyway, it's yourwomencircle.com. Oh my goodness. Well, as you already know, guess what? Yes, I happen to know that there's a creative spirit about to join the circle. Doris Reed is a poet who has authored several books of poetry along with several children's books. Let's welcome Doris to the circle. Hello, Good how morning. are you? Good morning. I'm feeling fantastic. How are you? I'm feeling blessed. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, it is my pleasure. And I understand that my last guest, Gail Christian, is a fan. She actually did the intro for you. Okay. I think she's going to take my job. That's what I think is happening. Okay. <laughs> okay? She's one of my you know, favorite people, too. She really is. Wow. Ever did. That is so cool because she said the exact same thing about you as well. So that's okay. pretty cool to have one of one of Gail's favorite people on. You know what I love to do? I would love for you just to, to, to kick this off by sharing some of your work. Do you have something you can share with us? Uh, actually, I do. Uh, and this piece, I think, is really uh, pertinent because it's called Beginnings. And we certainly are in a phase of new beginnings. Absolutely. So I will uh, share this with you guys. It's called Beginnings. A new beginning has just begun, providing for everyone a chance of renewal to get recharged, full steam ahead, no task too large. Always remember why on the third day he arose to give us all another chance, old chapters to close. Through God's good graces, we have this far come and with his helping hand, all battles will be won. So find quiet moments, take time to pray, rejoice, give thanks for each new dawn of day. A new beginning is all around. The beauty of its meaning knows no bound. It is the gentle hug to ease a fear, the gift of friendships year after year, a smile of encouragement, the sweet smell of success, comfort in knowing you've given your best. The joy of new beginnings is magical, a parable of faith unsurpassable, a lesson in patience, life's art of weight, a reflection of self-love, not self-hate. It is a time of healing, being with those who care, love all encompassing, happiness to share. It reminds us all of how precious life is. So enjoy the richness of family, friends, and kids. Follow your dreams wherever they may lead and don't be afraid to do as you please. New beginnings is a cyclical of change, rhythmic, but never quite the same. All too soon, minutes slip away drawing ever closer towards the end of day. So smell the roses by a pond sit, walk barefoot every chance you get, live life to the fullest, let your love light shine, always face the rising sun and the shadows will fall behind. I love it. I love- that was Thank that was amazing. You. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Wow. I love okay. it. It absolutely gave me chills. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Right. So I do know that you have you write poetry, you've written books. What inspires you to write? Um life, experiences, people, 
Uh, I have some pieces. Uh, one piece, one of my signature pieces is called uh, Harmonica Man, and it really was based on a gentleman I met one night at a, a jazz session, if you will. And this guy looked like he had just come off the street, but when he started playing, it was just a magical moment. And it, it uh, I wrote that poem based on meeting him that night. And then, you know, a piece about my mom or, you know, uh, I like to perform with music. So I have a lot of pieces that are musically inspired. And my mother was not only an educator, but a jazz pianist. And uh, so we were around a lot of uh, musicians growing up. So, uh, you know, just whatever. You whatever. Know, just, I yeah, love whatever. It. I love Absolutely. it. I love it. Inspired by all things. Speaking Absolutely. of inspiration, I read, I was reading about you. Of course, you know, I have to do my homework and whatnot. And I okay. understand that the entire student body of an LA elementary school memorized and recited a piece of your work called Reflections. Can you tell me how that came about and what? Like, what did you feel to have all of these kids reciting your stuff? How did that happen? Okay, it was uh, not necessarily the whole student body, but the entire fifth grade body class. And uh, I worked with, uh, I was, uh, I provided staff work to the LA County Commission on HIV. So I was a staff analyst and one of the commissioners had uh, bought my album and she was uh, raising her grandkids so she really, really liked the piece, which is the title of the album, Reflections, which is a uh, an African piece. And uh, so she took it to her uh, daughter's fifth grade teacher. And after, I'd say in a couple of weeks, he called and asked if the class could do it. But I really thought he was just talking about his class. Mm -hmm. So when they called to invite me to the performance, I was stunned uh, that it was all these kids and not only were they reciting it, they were also acting it out. And I was completely wow. blown away. And, uh, you know, of course the tears started flowing because it's <laughs> always, uh, my heart always feels when children read my work. I just, mm -hmm. you know, because that's, that means that I'm touching that age group as well. So yeah, yeah that was a magical moment. Oh, I can, only, I can only imagine. I can only yeah. imagine. I feel the same way when I hear people literally quote me. You know, I'm like, I right. hey, just said Angie Harvey quote. So that's right. pretty cool. I know yeah. that you've written some, some books of poetry, but you've also written some children's books. What inspired you to write children's books? I, uh, my children's book is called The Spider and the Fly. And it's a classic uh, take on a sticky situation. That's what I say. Uh, because I find that when you listen to that inner voice and you know that you shouldn't really do what you're about to do, and when you do what you shouldn't do, the situation really does not turn out well. So I thought, uh, and I, I say this, that this is for ages zero to 100 because everybody can benefit from that, that inner voice. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it would be uh, interesting to put that in a story form. It's actually one long poem in a storybook form. Wow. And, uh, you know, to maybe give a uh, pause when you're thinking about something, maybe you can mm -hmm. uh, think about this because the fly, the, uh, the fly gets caught because she ignored her mother's warning about spiders. So, you know, and it's the whole story around that. So I think that's something that you can uh, use in everyday life and teach your children as well. Absolutely. And and you, yeah. you brought up something that was very pivotal, and that is that poetry, sometimes people are entertained by poetry, but I know many poets and many, many poets do know that there are, are lessons to be learned in those places. Um, right. And so I know that some of our viewers are poets and have written poetry at various times of, of their life, but choose not to share. Why do you choose to share your work? And, and, and what could you say to other people uh, about the importance of being able to share some of, of our life that comes out in the form of a poem? Well, I think that uh, if I've experienced something or gone through something that I've written about in a certain kind of way, if that can help somebody kind of avoid a pit, you know, a pit stop or something like that, then I'm for that. But 
you know, writing is very personal to a lot of people. And it's just like the great artists. They don't always share their work, but it doesn't, uh, you know, stop them from being good at what they do. But I like to share my work because I feel like we have enough negativity. You know, people need to feel good about themselves and understand that, yes, situations do happen, but you can and will get through it. And uh, you have to pull on that inner strength. So if my writing can help people kind of look at themselves and say, you know, I've been there and done that, but I can get through that, then I'm all for it. Because I really truly want to just inspire, encourage, and uplift. All and right, that's what then. I do. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's that is what you have done here today. Did you bring something yeah. else that you could share with us? Uh Girl Scout motto, always be prepared. Yes. Come on now. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, have a piece uh, that was inspired by, I don't have children, but I was just, uh, I was also a social worker at one point, and I met a lot of young women and women who, I just didn't feel that they were given any building blocks to help them in their life or to help them uh, to encourage fortitude and self-worth and self-love. So I was like, what would I write to my daughter if I had a daughter, what words would I say over her life? And from that came this piece called Joy. Beautiful little girl sitting quietly at life's tree, looking at the world in wide-eyed wonder at the many things to see. So innocent and trusting, full of grace and charm. I'd long to hold you forever and protect you from all harm. Watching you in deep thought, so lovely to behold, you are much more precious than all the silver and gold. Fruit from my body, apple of my eye, I will love you forever until the day I die. And when the time comes for you to make your way, let nothing or no one from your dreams do sway. The challenge of the world awaits to accept as you see fit. Even when blue skies gray, think twice before you quit. Strength and determination are worthy virtues to possess. Take them with you on life's journey to help you do your best. Wrap my love around you as you go your way to protect and see you through each and every day. Keep a smile on your lips, a song in your heart. Always try to finish those things that you start. Take the hand of fate firmly in yours. She will provide staunch support and open many doors. The world is an oyster willing to share its treasures. Remain steadfast but diligent and enjoy the many pleasures. With quiet assurance, I want you to know my prayers will be with you wherever you choose to go. Time fast approaches when you must go alone, embarking upon adventures so very far from home. But you will always be my beautiful little girl. And one day soon, I will proudly give my joy to the world. There you have wow. it. Wow, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Doris, for sharing pieces of your poetry and pieces of yourself with us all. You all can check out her books and her CDs at DorisKayReed.com. That's right. DorisKayReed.com. Thank you again for being a part of our circle. We truly Thank appreciate you. Oh, you're so welcome. Okay. To you as well. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> you too. Wow. That was great, man. Okay. So guess what? Your Women's Circle has a new website, and I want to invite you to go check it out. You might find a few pictures of me on the, on the site, yes. And while you're there, please leave us your email address so that you can stay in the know and always be a part of our circle. Well, the circle's about to close, but not before I thank my guest. Yes, Gail Christian and Doris Reed, I want to thank you very much for being a part of this space with us. It was definitely a pleasure to have you women in the circle with me today.
And I also want to thank all of you for showing up and helping me make Mondays sexy again. Let's do it again next week. Okay. Meanwhile, don't forget, talk about us behind our backs. That means share this video, introduce someone to your women's organization, and let someone know that your Women's Circle Live has a hostess with the mostest. Oh, and don't forget, it is all about you.